The Sound of Waves, Chapter 6 Returning from fishing the next day, Shinji set out for the lighthouse carrying two scorpion fish, each about five or six inches long, strung by the gills on a straw rope. He'd already climbed to the rear of Yashiro's shrine when he remembered that he hadn't yet offered a prayer of thanks to the god for having showered him with blessings so quickly. He went back to the front of the shrine and prayed devoutly. His prayer finished, Shinji gazed out over the gulf of eyes already shining in the moonlight and breathed deeply. Clouds were floating above the horizon, looking like ancient gods. The boy felt a consummate accord between himself and this opulence of nature that surrounded him. He inhaled deeply, and it was as though a part of the unseen something that constitutes nature had permeated the core of his being. He heard the sound of the waves striking the shore, and it was as though the surging of his young blood was keeping time with the movement of the sea's great tides. It was doubtless because nature itself satisfied his need that Shinji felt no particular lack of music in his everyday life. Shinji lifted the scorpion fish to the level of his eyes and stuck out his tongue at their ugly, thorny faces. The fish were definitely alive, but they made not the slightest movement. So Shinji poked one in the jaw and watched it flop about in the air. Thus the boy was loitering along the way, loath to have the happy meeting take place too quickly. Both the lighthouse keeper and his wife had taken Hatsu, the newcomer, to their warm hearts. Just when she was so silent that they were thinking maybe she wasn't so attractive after all, suddenly she would break into her lovely girlish laughter. And if she sometimes seemed lost in the clouds, she was also most considerate. For instance, at the end of an etiquette lesson, Hatsu would immediately begin clearing away the cups they had drunk their tea in, a thoughtful action that never would have occurred to the other girls. And while she was at it, she would go on to wash any other dirty dishes she might find in the kitchen. The couple at the lighthouse had one child, a daughter, who was attending the university in Tokyo, She only came home during vacations and, in her absence, they regarded these village girls who came so often to their house as their own children. They took a deep interest in the girls' futures and when good fortune came to one of them, they were as pleased as though the girl had been their own child. The lighthouse keeper, who had been in this service for 30 years, was feared by the village children because of his stern look and the tremendous voice with which he stormed at the young scamps who stole in to explore the lighthouse but at heart he was actually a gentle person. Solitude had divested him of any feeling that men could have base motives. At a lighthouse there can be no greater treat than to have visitors. Surely no one would go the great distance to call at an isolated lighthouse with hidden ill will, or at least any such feelings would surely vanish from his heart in the face of the unreserved hospitality he was certain to receive. Actually, it was just as the lighthouse keeper so often said, Bad intentions cannot travel as far as good. The mistress, too, was truly a good person, and also very well read. Not only had she once been a teacher in a rural girls' high school, but her many years of living in lighthouses had fostered her love of reading even more, until she now possessed an almost encyclopedic knowledge about everything. If she knew that La Scala Opera House was in Milan, she also knew that such and such a Tokyo film star had recently sprained her right ankle at such and such a place. She would argue her husband into a corner and then, as if to make amends, put her whole soul into darning his socks or fixing his supper. When visitors came, she would chatter away incessantly. The villagers listened spellbound to the mistress's eloquence, some of them comparing her unfavourably with their own taciturn women, and feeling a meddlesome sort of sympathy for the lighthouse keeper. But he himself had great respect for his wife's learning. The living quarters provided for the lighthouse keeper was a one-storey house of three rooms. Everything about it was kept as neat and polished as the lighthouse itself. A steamship company calendar hung on the wall, and the ashes in the sunken hearth of the sitting room were always neatly shaped up around the charcoal. Even in their daughter's absence, her desk stood in one corner of the parlour, its polished surface reflecting the blue glass of an empty pen tray and decorated with a French doll. Behind the house, there was a cauldron-style bath heated by gas made from the dregs of the oil used to lubricate the beacon light. 
unlike conditions in the squalid houses of the fishermen, here even the indigo pattern of the new washed hand towel hanging by the basin at the toilet room door was always bright and clean. The lighthouse keeper spent the greater part of each day beside the sunken hearth, smoking cheap new life cigarettes, economically cutting them into short lengths and fitting them into a long slender brass pipe. The lighthouse was dead during the daytime, with only one of the young assistants in the watch house to report ship movements. Toward evening that day, even though no etiquette lesson was scheduled, Hatsu came visiting, bringing a door gift of some sea cucumbers wrapped in newspaper. Beneath her blue serge skirt, she was wearing long flesh-coloured stockings, and over them, red socks. Her sweater was her usual scarlet one. Hatsu had no sooner entered the house than the mistress began giving advice not minting her words. When you wear a blue skirt, Hatsu-san, you ought to wear black hose. I know you have some because you were wearing them only the other day. Well, blushing slightly, Hatsu sat down beside the hearth. At the regular lessons of etiquette and homemaking, the girls sat listening fairly intently and the mistress spoke in a lecturing tone of voice. But now, seated by the hearth with Hatsu, she began talking in a free and easy way. As her visitor was a young girl, she talked first in a general sort of way about love and finally got around to asking such direct questions as, isn't there someone you like very much? At times when the lighthouse keeper saw the girl become rattled, he would ask a teasing question of his own. When it began to grow late, they asked Hatsu several times if she didn't have to get home for supper and if her father wouldn't be waiting for her. It was Hatsu who finally made the suggestion that she help prepare their supper. Until now, Hatsu had simply sat there, blushing furiously and looking down at the floor, not so much as touching the refreshments put before her. But, once in the kitchen, she quickly recovered her good spirits. Then, while slicing the sea cucumbers, she began singing the traditional eyes chorus used on the island for accompanying the lantern festival dancing. She'd learned it from her aunt the day before. Tall chests, long chests, travelling chests. Since your dower is so great, my daughter, you must never think of coming back. But oh, my mother, you ask too much. When the east is cloudy, they say the wind will blow. When the west is cloudy, they say the rain will fall. And when a fair wind changes, yoi, Sora, even the largest ship returns to port. Oh, have you already learned that song, Hatsu-san? The mistress said. Here, it's already three years since we came here, and I don't know it all even yet. Well, but it's almost the same as the one we sang at Ozaki, Hatsu answered. Just then, there was the sound of footsteps outside, and from the darkness, someone called, Good evening! That must be Shinji-san, the mistress said, sticking her head out the kitchen door. Then, well, well, more nice fish, thanks. Father, Kubo-san's brought us more fish. Thanks again, thanks again, the lighthouse keeper called from the hearth. Come on in, Shinji boy, come on in. During this confusion of welcome and thanks, Shinji and Hatsu exchanged glances. Shinji smiled. Hatsu smiled too. But the mistress happened to turn around suddenly and intercepted their smiles. Oh, you two already know each other, do you? Hmm. It's a small place, this village, but that makes it all the better, so do come on in, Shinji-san. Oh, and by the way, we had a letter from Chiyoko in Tokyo. She particularly asked about Shinji-san. I don't guess there's much doubt about who Chiyoko likes, is there? She'll be coming home soon for spring vacation, so be sure and come to see her. Shinji had been just on the point of coming into the house for a minute, but these words seemed to wrench his nose. Hatsu turned back to the sink and didn't look around again. The boy retreated back into the dusk. They called him several times, but he wouldn't come back. He made his bow from a distance and then took to his heels. That's Shinji-san. He's really the bashful one, isn't he, father? The mistress said, laughing. The lone sound of her laughter echoed through the house. Neither the lighthouse keeper nor Hatsu even smiled. Shinji waited for Hatsu where the path curved around Woman's Slope. At that point, the dusk surrounding the lighthouse gave way to the last faint light that still remained of the sunset. Even though the shadows of the pine trees had become doubly dark, the sea below them was brimming with a last afterglow. 
All through the day, the first easterly winds of spring had been blowing in off the sea, and even now that night was falling, the wind didn't feel cold on the skin. As Shinji rounded woman's slope, even that small wind died away, and there was nothing left in the dusk but calm shafts of radiance pouring down between the clouds. Looking down, he saw the small promontory that jutted out into the sea to form the far side of Utajima's harbour. From time to time, its tip was shrugging its rocky shoulders swaggeringly, rending asunder the foaming waves. The vicinity of the promontory was especially bright. Standing on the promontory's peak, there was a lone red pine, its trunk bathed in the afterglow and vividly clear to the boy's keen eyes. Suddenly, the trunk lost the last beam of light. The clouds overhead turned black and the stars began to glitter above Mount Higashi. Shinji laid his ear against a jutting rock and heard the sound of short, quick footsteps approaching along the flagstone path that led down from the stone steps at the entrance to the lighthouse residence. He was planning to hide here as a joke and give Hatsu a scare when she came by. But as those sweet-sounding footsteps came closer and closer, he became shy about frightening the girl. Instead, he deliberately let her know where he was by whistling a few lines from the eyes chorus she'd been singing earlier. When the east is cloudy, they say the wind will blow. When the west is cloudy, they say the rain will fall. And even the largest ship. Hatsu rounded woman's slope with her footsteps never paused. She walked right on past as though she had no idea Shinji was there. Hey, hey! But still the girl did not look back. There was nothing to do but for him to walk silently along after her. Entering the pine grove, the path became dark and steep. The girl was lighting her way with a small flashlight. Her steps became slower, and before she was aware of it, Shinji had taken the lead. Suddenly, the girl gave a little scream. The beam of the flashlight soared like a startled bird from the base of the pine trees up into the treetops. The boy whirled around, then he put his arms around the girl lying sprawled on the ground and pulled her to her feet. As he helped Hatsu up, the boy remembered with shame how he had lain in wait for her a while ago, had given that whistled signal and had followed after her. Even though his actions had been prompted by the circumstances, to him they still seemed to smack of evil. Making no move to repeat yesterday's caress, he brushed the dirt off the girl's clothing as gently as though he were her big brother. The soil here was mostly dry sand and the dirt brushed off easily. Luckily, there was no sign of any damage. Hatsu stood motionless, like a child, resting her hand on Shinji's strong shoulder while he brushed her. Then she looked around for the flashlight, which she had dropped. It was lying on the ground behind them, still throwing its faint, fan-shaped beam, showing the ground covered with pine needles. The island's heavy twilight pressed in upon the single area of faint light. Look where it landed. I must have thrown it behind me when I fell. The girl spoke in a cheerful, laughing voice. What made you so mad? Shinji asked, looking her full in the face. All that talk about you and Chiyoko-san. Stupid. Then there's nothing to it? There's nothing to it. The two walked along side by side, Shinji holding the flashlight and guiding Hatsu along the difficult path as though he were a ship's pilot. There was nothing in particular to say, so the usually silent Shinji began to talk, stumblingly to fill in the silence. As for me, someday I want to buy a coastal freighter with the money I've worked for and saved, and then go into the shipping business with my brother, carrying lumber from Kishu and coal from Kyushu. Then I'll have my mother take it easy, and when I get old I'll come back to the island and take it easy too. No matter where I sail, I'll never forget our island. It has the most beautiful scenery in all Japan. Every person on Utajima was firmly convinced of this. And in the same way, I'll do my best to help make life on our island the most peaceful there is anywhere. The happiest there is anywhere. Because if we don't do that, everyone will start forgetting the island and quit wanting to come back. No matter how much times change, very bad things, very bad ways, will all always disappear before they get to our island. The sea... It only brings the good and right things that the island needs and keeps the good and right things we already have here. That's why there's not a thief on the whole island, nothing but brave, manly people. 
people who always have the will to work truly and well and put up with whatever comes, people whose love is never double-faced, people with nothing mean about them anywhere. Of course the boy was not so articulate and his way of speaking was confused and disconnected, but this is roughly what he told Hatsu in this moment of rare fluency. She didn't interrupt, but kept nodding her head in agreement with everything he said. Never once looking bored, her face overflowed with an expression of genuine sympathy and trust, all of which filled Shinji with joy. Shinji didn't want her to think he was being frivolous, and at the end of his serious speech he purposely omitted that last important hope that he had included in his prayer to the sea god a few nights before. There was nothing to hinder, and the path continued hiding them in the dense shadows of the trees, but this time Shinji didn't even hold Hatsu's hand, much less dream of kissing her again. What had happened yesterday on the dark beach? To them that seemed not to have been an act of their own volition. It had been an undreamed of event, brought about by some force outside themselves. It was a mystery how such a thing had come about. This time, they barely managed to make a date to meet again at the observation tower on the afternoon of the next time the fishing boats could not go out. When they emerged from the back of Yashiro Shrine, Hatsu gave a little gasp of admiration and stopped walking. Shinji stopped too. The village was suddenly ablaze with brilliant lights. It was exactly like the opening of some spectacular, soundless festival. Every window shone with a bright and indomitable light, a light without the slightest resemblance to the smoky light of oil lamps. It was as though the village had been restored to life and come floating up out of the black night. The electric generator, so long out of order, had been repaired. Outside the village, they took different paths, and Hatsu went on alone down the stone steps and into the village, lit again, after such a long time, with street lamps.